As we look to the future to envision what our environment will be, it's always helpful to look to the past, to the leaders and the legacy that was there before. And in looking at what has happened to our natural resources in the 20th century in the United States and Florida, it is important to consider the role of women when it comes to parks, wildlife, all natural resources, women were using a variety of techniques to try to save what they considered a beautiful, Edenic place for all of us. They used petition drives, grassroots organizing, uh, lobbying, even in, before they had the vote. And they had to very often combat the all-male power structure and business structure that still exists today. But by the end of the 20th century, Women had become leaders in state environmental groups and bureaucracies. Springtime in Florida, the orange blossoms are blooming, the days are getting longer, and if you're a bird, you're putting on your beautiful nesting plumage in order to attract a mate, which is a wonderful thing. Unless, of course, your plumes are considered more valuable as women's hats. Indeed, this was the fashion trend at the beginning of the 20th century to place bird feathers and bird bodies on women's hats and their dresses. It was a $17 million a year business centered in New York City and in Europe, and it involved the deaths of hundreds of thousands of wading birds every year. Florida was ground zero for much of this. Some 42 species of Florida birds were being used this way. For hats for women's fashions. That infuriated a lot of conservation-minded women, including Clara Domrick, who left the cold and dankness of New York City winters every year to come to her winter home in Maitland, Florida. She was concerned about what was happening with the birds that they had made their, she and her husband had made their home a bird sanctuary. And so on a March morning in 1900, Clara assembled a group of the who's who in Central Florida, and together they created the Florida Audubon Society. Their first task, to raise public awareness and to go to the legislature to get bird protection laws. Clara died within the year, never living to see what Florida Audubon would become, a very powerful and important environmental group. But she had planted the seeds for the future. Did you know that Florida's women created our first state park? It was called Royal Palm State Park, and it was created in 1916 on a hammock island in the Everglades. Women and botanists were quite concerned that the beautiful royal palms that lived there, along with some unique orchids and bird life, were going to disappear because of nearby development. And so the women toiled uh, collecting land donations and pestering the legislature to get the park created, and it was created in 1916. But for several years, women were the ones who funded the park until they could get the legislature to pick up the tab. May Man Jennings was the leader of women's groups in this battle for the park, and she was one of the most, probably the most powerful woman in Florida, and perhaps one of the most powerful people in the state of Florida. She was the wife and later widow of a Florida governor, and she knew everybody in the state and knew how to get things done, especially through her old girls network. <laughs> For example, when May wanted to go to Tallahassee to lobby the legislature about the park, she first contacted her women's club friends. They gave her the name of the head of the women's club in Tallahassee. The head of the women's club in Tallahassee put her in contact with the governor's wife. So that when May went to Tallahassee to do her work at, before the legislature, she stayed in the governor's mansion. How is that for power and connectivity? May was also known as the mother of Florida forestry because she and a lot of women's groups were very concerned about what was happening in the state as in forestry practices. At one point in the southeastern United States, some 60 million acres was covered in longleaf pine forests. And these are beautiful forests. These trees can grow 50 to 60 feet in height, live up to 500 years old. But the forestry practice at the time was either to cut the trees or damage them through turpentining and then move on. There was no replanting, no thought for the future at all. 
So May and a group of women's club members fought to get the laws changed in Florida. The loss of uh, longleaf pine is uh, estimated that 98% of it has disappeared and it's been considered one of the largest ecological losses in the world. So they were fighting a very real and very important battle. You can't talk about Florida's environment without talking about the three Marjories. First, Marjorie Kenan Rawlings, the Pulitzer Prize winning author who taught the country to love the rural Florida environment in which she lived. You may have read her books, The Yearling or Cross Creek, in which she chronicles the people and places there. I mean, I could go on and on about the Marjorie, so I think what I'll do is I'll just give you some facts that you may not know. One thing to know about Rawlings is that she was not an activist in a sense, but she, during World War II, became very concerned about forestry practices in Florida. And as a result, she ended up writing an article for Collier's Magazine during the war, in which she argued that many things were important for the war effort, but so was saving Florida's trees. Marjorie Harris Carr helped stop the Cross Florida State Barge Canal that was slated to cut across the northern part of the state, uh, supposedly connecting the coasts for easier tra traffic. But through her group, the Florida Defenders of the Environment, they proved through pa facts and much passion that it was really a boondoggle. As a result of her work, which included enormous amounts of fact gathering and grassroots organizing, they stopped the Barge Canal in 1971 by presidential edict. It was the first time in the United States that a federal public works project so far along in process had been stopped by presidential edict. One interesting thing about Carr is whenever she went to hearings, very often uh, she would be portrayed as just a little Micanopy housewife. But when she got up to speak, she could eviscerate her opponents because she was in fact a master's trained biologist who knew exactly what she was talking about and was well versed in a fairly new field, ecology. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was a New England transplant to Florida who gave us, through her wonderful book, The Way to Understand the Everglades. Her book was called Everglades River of Grass, and through that description, she helped us to understand this important wetland and how it operated. What you may not know about Douglas is she did not become an activist on behalf of the Everglades until she was 79 years old. And she did it at a time when there was a proposed SST uh, jet port proposed in the middle of the Everglades. And she got involved and started a group called the Friends of the Everglades, a group that continues today. Dressed in her signature floppy hat and thick glasses, she would use her grandmotherly authority to go to meetings in order to uh, protect the Everglades, to argue on behalf of it. And as she used to say, they can't be mean to me, I'm a little old lady. <laughs> but I can certainly be rude to them. <laughs> and when you live to be 108, you can get a lot of things done. I use her as an example of it never being too late to get involved and to have a huge impact. By the middle of the 20th century, it became clear that Florida was experiencing problems that had been seen in other states. Air pollution, water pollution, land degradation and women were having no part of it. In Jacksonville, women protested smokestacks that spewed pollutants that literally melted the stockings off their legs. In Polk County, women protested phosphate mills that left asthma-inducing pollutants in the air. In Tampa Bay and in Miami, women argued that sewage needed to be treated before it was dumped directly into our waterways. And other women fought to preserve land that they saw as important habitats, especially for endangered species. Many women got involved in endangered species protection. They sought habitat protection and laws to protect manatees. Two women sued in order to get control of beach lighting that would protect sea turtles that we all love today. One woman who got heavily involved in protecting land was Doris Leeper, better known as Doc to her friends, because at one point she had tried to train to be a doctor, but that was really frowned upon for women in her era. So she moved to the Canaveral area to pursue her art and sculpture. 
And while there, she literally could not ignore problems in her own backyard. Cars and fishermen and traffic were damaging the dunes along a beautiful stretch of beach. And when she asked law enforcement to help her in controlling all that, she got deaf ears. So Doc, to whom no one said no, rallied local people together and they helped in, in, with the creation of Canaveral National Seashore in 1975, widely considered one of the most beautiful gems on the US Eastern Coast. Interesting thing though, when you go and read the official history of Canaveral National Seashore, there is simply no mention of Doc. And I asked some people why, how is that? And they said, well, you know, she ruffled a lot of feathers along the way, including the male establishment. So they were only too happy to write her out of the history when they got the opportunity. Environmental justice became a huge issue in the late 20th century, and many women got involved in this when they began to realize that the people most likely to be harmed by environmental degradation were the poor and minority groups. Joy Ezel, to this day, has continued a 20-year battle to save the Finn Holloway River in Perry, Florida. During World War II, in an effort to attract a paper mill, the Florida legislature gave them permission to dump all of their pollutants into the Finn Holloway River, designating it an industrial river. You can smell the dioxin in the Finn Holloway River, a known carcinogen. Jeannie Economos works with the human victims of Lake Apopka pollution. There, many people were exposed to agricultural chemicals during the course of their work. And while much money has been poured into understanding why a number of birds died there several years ago, a mere pittance has been spent on understanding the human cost of contamination from these chemicals. By the end of the 20th century, women were moving into new kinds of leadership roles in the state. They were now able to vote. They were now able to be elected to office, and it made a whole new complexion in the environmental movement in Florida. Mary Grizzle started out as a PTA president, the mother of six, when she got involved in Republican politics and in 1963 was elected to the state legislature. There, she became known for a number of environmental stands, including a 1972 law that required much tougher standards for treatment of sewage before it was dumped into Tampa Bay. Victoria Schinkel, when she applied for a job in 1974 with the state uh, environmental agency was first asked what, about her husband, her possibility of having children, you know, and what her husband's job would entail. But she persevered and at age 33 became the head of the Florida Department of Environmental Regulation, the largest bureaucracy in the state of Florida. And she continues today to fight for environmental improvements in the state with a particular concentration on growth management issues. Perhaps no woman, however, illustrates the changing women's roles in the state of Florida and the nation more than Carol Browner. Browner was a, is a Florida native. She worked in a number of environmental agencies in Florida and in the nation, and in 1993 became the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, arguably the largest environmental bureaucracy in the world. There, Browner took a hard look at air pollution issues, toxic and hazardous waste disposal, and very often invoked her image as a mother in worrying over whether these health damaging issues would continue into the United States. So from Clara Domerick's living room to Carol Browner's desk at the EPA, we see a wide range of women's activities and power during the 20th century. Some started out just as concerned mothers, concerned club women, garden club members, while others got involved in issues involving politics, environmental regulation. Whether we have an Everglades today that looks like Everglades National Park, or an Everglades that is paved over, wetlands that are lost in the state of Florida, will, will we follow this legacy that these women have given us? These are the decisions we need to make as we're envisioning the environment of tomorrow. And hopefully, we can pick up the banner and carry on the battle that they began so long ago.